Welcome back, everybody, to the Kalispell Warhawk Dynasty on NCAA Football 14. Today we have the edited offseason for year 12 of the series. We are moving on to year 13 in this long-running dynasty. So today I'm recapping what happened over the weekend with the latest offseason stream. If you want to watch the whole nearly three-hour event, it is linked but this recap will go over all the important events during the offseason. I knew we had some really good players graduating the team. We had Daniel Foster, James Huggins, Austin Jenkins, three of our starting offensive linemen. I was waiting to see what surprises would be thrown our way in the beginning. But here are the bull results. The national championship was between Army and Stanford. And Army emerged victorious with their dominant running game. They had Heisman Trophy winner John Madison get 90 yards and a score. So Stanford, they go all the way through undefeated until the national championship. Let's get on to the actual offseason portion now. Players leaving and coaching changes up first. I always worry about losing our coordinators, especially after seasons where we finish pretty high in the standings. We won the Rose Bowl this year, and we indeed have new coordinators for year 13. However, they're both experienced and have their skill trees mostly unlocked. We now have Joe Rudolph at offensive coordinator, who was previously the OC for Northwestern, and Van Malone, who was the defensive coordinator at Houston. For players leaving, I had some concerns about who might decide to declare early. I was surprised that Michael Hurst and Thomas Kane both declared, but there were other players I was worried about that did not declare. I thought Luke Irvin was a possibility as a redshirt sophomore, and there was also Ronnie Howard and Nick Robinson at corner. Of course now I no longer try to convince players to stay as kind of a rule for the dynasty, so I had another offensive line spot I had to take care of for this offseason. We're replacing four of five. Here are some of the other draft results. Eric Outlaw from Arizona State was drafted. Army had a fourth round punter. Auburn had a third round fullback. And Penn State. I didn't know this was quite possible. I hadn't really noticed it before. But Lameca Warwick as a redshirt sophomore did declare early. Which means there should have been a chance that Luke Irvin could have done the same. But obviously he didn't and he is returning. So very good news there. For offseason recruiting, I knew Isaac Jones was going to be the number one prospect. He was a great athlete, a four-star player, and I wanted him to play running back. We were losing Austin Jenkins, and I thought he would be a solid replacement, good pass catcher, decent athlete. Wasn't sure how good he would be, but he was still really intriguing for either running back or receiver. Lance Davis was arguably the best player available, even if his overall didn't reflect that. His cover skills were simply very good, and I couldn't pass up on trying to increase our cornerback depth. I also wanted to put some points into the battle for Joseph Hollis and give us some extra quarterback depth, and I felt like he would be a player that would progress pretty well after a couple years. Spencer Petty. This is a three-team battle, so I thought it might take a little bit more points. Solid offensive lineman. I wanted to make sure we had enough depth there. He's a good four-star player. And then Terry Sears. Nice balanced skill set at the linebacker spot, and I knew linebacker was going to be a lot thinner for us this coming season. I felt pretty good going into signing day, and here's what happened. Isaac Jones commits to Oregon State, meaning we miss out on our number one target for the first time in quite a while. We still won some of these recruiting battles and ended up with the number five ranked recruiting class, so overall, very strong. Joseph Hollis, another one of these weird situations where a player doesn't pick any school. We do get Lance Davis, winning this battle by 980 points over Nebraska. We had to overcome some points to win this. Did a pretty good job there. For Spencer Petty, very close, but we do beat Virginia to add the number five center in the class. We also get Phil London, but how about Isaac Jones? We lose 
by over 8,000 points, which means Oregon State had to have put 15,000 points in the Jones. They go all in and get their number one prospect. I was pretty confident we would add Jones and he'd have a pretty big role on offense, but instead I had to see what training results would bring our way. As far as quarterbacks go, Luke Irvin now has 99 quarterback accuracy, Antoine Morgans is up to 88. And for running back, very solid development, fives and sixes across the board. It looks like Jim Jackson could be our top running back this year, and we'll learn a lot about the rest of these backs that haven't played very much. Jermaine McIntyre doesn't have the best acceleration, Sean Merville does, he does have good speed as well. For receiver, only a plus two for Nick Lindsay. I was surprised by that, but given his catching is already so high and his route running is as well, I guess there wasn't as much room for his overall to rise. Sherrod Edwards got a nice boost, but didn't get as much catching as some of the other receivers. The next spot I was worried about was offensive line. When you replace 4 out of 5 starters, you're pretty much guaranteed to regress at least somewhat. But we ended up with a decent situation, all things considered. We return one starter, Kevin Hampton, at center. We're going to have mid to high 70s overall players on the left side with 90s on the right. So given we had to replace four offensive line starters, I like where we are going into year 13. For defense, we could count on some younger edge rushers with us losing Michael Hurst and also not getting the best play lately from Shannon Somerville. He peaked as a freshman. We have seen regression the last two years. And at linebacker, who replaces James Huggins? Anthony Payne could start an inside linebacker. Breland Kendrick has the most experience and is definitely our best linebacker. At cornerback, I was really surprised to only see a plus two from DeHante Jeffries. I expected him to have much more of a role this season, and he still might. His athleticism, especially for slot corner, is off the charts. So I still think he's going to play, but there will be some more competition for that spot. Of course, one of the themes of this offseason was Kalispell going independent. We're not in the Mountain West, and we're no longer in the Pac-12. We're going independent to set our own schedule and make things a lot more interesting for the remainder of the series. I'm not sure exactly how much longer the series is going to go, but I think that going independent gives us the best chance to uh, keep the series interesting. You're seeing some teams here that I want to put on the schedule this year. We didn't really see Montrell Bonds in the game in year 12 as he got injured, so I think we'll play Fresno State again, especially because our defensive coordinator last year is now their head coach. My plan with the schedule this year is to kind of make it a hybrid schedule. I want to play hopefully two to three games against Mountain West teams. Depends how many good teams there are. I also want to play a few from the Pac-12, and you can count on us playing Stanford at some point, along with Oregon and possibly Oregon State. And then from there, we're going to face some other top teams around the country and some rivals that we've seen from the past. We're going to play Penn State. We're going to play Texas, the only team to defeat us in year 12. We're also going to play Auburn and possibly Ole Miss. I went through different positions trying to find where the best receivers, corners, and I want to make sure we face some of that top talent and face teams that have different styles, hopefully. We may even take on Army after their national championship win and face their option offense. But you can leave your feedback down below as far as what you'd like to see from a schedule, along with the structure of the schedule. I'm not sure yet where I want to put the Stanford game. It looked like chat mostly wanted to see that one toward the end of the year. But I think that I'm open to uh, suggestions here as far as maybe a neutral site opener and how I should structure the order of everything. After a while, I got curious here with the rosters and began to look at things like the fastest quarterbacks and just the fastest players at different positions. There are three quarterbacks with 91 speed, including Penn State's replacement for Lameca Warwick, Zach Walker. We also found out there is a 93 speed punter in our league. 
And not only is he the fastest punter, he is the defending Ray Guy award winner, Antoine Poole. Maybe he'll be in a future Broncos franchise draft class. The remainder of the video is going to have some practice, not a ton this time. I ended up doing like a little running back competition toward the beginning, but I'm scrapping it here for the recap because I found something off with the sliders and fixed it midstream. But the passing game, that was pretty fun. Sherrod Edwards, he stands out from everybody else with his playmaking ability. We saw that a year ago. I expect even more big plays this season, especially if our running game takes a step back, missing Austin Jenkins and not having a great replacement. We can make anything happen with Luke Irvin and Sherrod Edwards, it seems. I also found this play. Love the design of it. And against the right coverages, you can hit the big play with ease. We also saw by testing out the deep ball that Elliot Red is just somebody you gotta throw away from. Thankfully, he's on our team, but he can pretty much break on any football and he's rarely out of position. Now, this is where I found that something was off here with the running game because it felt like all the running backs were slower than they should be. They wouldn't accelerate very fast. Their moves weren't as impactful. And we know how good Edwards is. So what if we try him there? Well, I saw like Maddox here with this spin move it was way more dynamic than Edwards once I moved him to running back. So it seems that the running back ability slider does impact a lot. And at 35, it was making anybody listed at running back on the depth chart basically play worse, which obviously impacted part of the season last year. It shows how good Austin Jenkins was that he still had some big games with that slider. But now it's back up to 45 where I previously had it and you'll see more of the running game now in the remainder of the video. I just didn't want to show uh, bad plays kind of skewing the opinion of those players after I edited. But I think Jim Jackson's going to be the lead back and it's going to be a very hot hand approach. But Jackson has good power. As long as he can have runs like that where he's falling forward, we keep the chains moving, we're going to be able to have a, a pretty good offense, I feel. We don't have to have this dynamic running game, but it's got to at least pick up some first downs for us and be a reliable option on first down and the short yardage situations. So I think Jackson's role is firmly secure. But beyond him... There's the speedy Sean Merville, but he didn't do enough in practice yet to separate himself. We also saw Mark Robinson, who's pretty speedy, and Marcus Mark. I think until someone can really impress, I'm going to be giving everybody an opportunity. And maybe things will get sorted out more so in the upcoming practice stream that I do now every offseason. There are some snaps and opportunities up for grabs at running back and at receiver. It looked like Phoenix Chambers is ready to be the number three wideout. It looks like Derek Jackson will be the number four. Jackson really struggled in traffic, and that's an area where Colt Sully was really good, and that's kind of the role he'd be replacing. So we'll have to see on him. His primary competition would then become Travis Clemens, who has some dynamic ability himself and did a pretty good job here in the red zone right here, for instance. There is also Josh Vincent, but I didn't see enough of him in the off-season streams, so I will have to organize all these position battles. It's not just on offense. Defensively, we have to figure out which linebackers are playing and in which packages. Obviously, I have some packages where they'll pass rush a little bit. That might be more what Rayshon McNeil's good at. And then I have to figure out who the two, like, nickel linebackers are going to be. Braylon Kendrick is going to be one. But after him, I don't know. There are a couple young players that were in the last class. There was Sears and Trey Little. And then a lot of players in that high 70, low 80 overall range. So hopefully I can figure it out in the offseason. Sometimes I don't pay enough attention to defense here, but I'm going to have to to make the right choices. Tahante Jeffries also had a really good practice. I thought he was good in coverage and also showed that he liked to hit a little bit as well. So I think that slot role especially is very enticing for him. 
But that will wrap up the offseason recap. Those are all of the important storylines and events. I think we have a very good team entering this year. I expect us to be very tough to beat, but our schedule should hopefully make this season much more interesting than year 12. I want to play tougher teams. I want tougher competition and a lot more intrigue this season. So we'll see if we can accomplish that and have a successful year 13 with the Kalispell Warhawks. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you enjoyed today's video and are looking forward to another new season of Kalispell Warhawks. Hawk football and I'm hoping to make it a more exciting one than year 12. I'll see you all next time. Have a great day.